Um, next, speaking of cell lines, let's talk about how we can best use those cell lines um, further and further. So uh, Dr. Levine is coming to us for the first time from the University of Connecticut. Um, he's going to talk to us about the contribution of GABA-A receptor subunit deletion to Angelman syndrome uh, pathophysiology. And this is also based on iPSC cell lines and understanding how cells behave with and without Angelman syndrome. Dr. Levine. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to um, tell you about our work. So first we want to say that um, we know that UBE3A, the loss of UBE3A in neurons is a primary driver for Angelman syndrome, and we've heard a lot about UBE3A and its importance today. But we also know that the non-UBE3A genes in the region where we lose one copy of those genes also contribute to Angelman syndrome pathophysiology and behavioral phenotypes. And we know that because although most AS individuals have the larger deletion that includes the full region, there are a class of non-deletion AS patients who can have up to a complete loss of UBE3A in their neurons, but they don't have loss of those other genes. And that population of uh, individuals has a much less severe phenotype than deletion AS individuals, particularly with regard to seizures and also other aspects of the Angelman uh, phenotype. And the only genetic difference between those two classes of individuals is the uh, deletion AS has the hemizygous or one copy loss of uh, non-UBE3A genes in the region. So clearly those genes are contributing to the pathophysiology. Now, a lot of current drug development efforts are obviously focused on UBE3A reinstatement. Clearly that's a very exciting area, very important, and very likely to have an important impact on AS individuals. But we're doing research that we think may be important for the next generation of Angelman therapeutics that exploit the roles of these other genes in contributing to the pathophysiology. So I'm completely on board with Art Baudet's suggestion earlier today that the, uh, another pillar of Angelman therapeutics should be the role of these non-UBE3A genes. Uh, they may be effective in addressing specific phenotypes that are maybe non-UBE3 related. They may reduce overall symptom severity. And they also may potentially extend the therapeutic window. We know at least for some aspects of Angelman, UBE3A reinstatement is important to be done very early. And there's a possibility that some of these other genes may contribute over a longer time period. And so it may extend that potential therapeutic window. So in terms of which genes may contribute in addition to UB3A, you heard a little bit about this. You heard about this in um, Allison's talk. Um, I'm, all of those genes that are in green, they're not all labeled, are biallelically expressed. So there's one copy loss of all those genes. I just highlighted some of the ones that we think potentially may play an important role in Angelman pathophysiology. And you know we've learned a lot about Angelman syndrome from rodent models. But it's important to keep in mind that really up to this time, all of the mice and rat models for modeling Angelman syndrome are limited to the loss of UBE3A. So they're a great model for non-deletion Angelman syndrome, but they really don't model the typical deletion uh, that we see in Angelman syndrome. Uh, there are some, some new mouse models uh, in the pipeline that hopefully will address this. But up until this point, these models have really not allowed us to address the role of these other genes. So we can't really even ask the question, and we can also think that when we study the effects of UBE3A UBE reinstatement in these models, we're looking to obviously reverse the effects of loss of UBE3A, but we still don't have a good handle on what UBE3A reinstatement will do in the context of the larger deletion. So to address this, as Allison just mentioned, we're going to use iPS cells. And you just got a great introduction to iPSC technology from Dr. Liu. The main advantage is that we can generate human neurons with the exact genotype of the affected donor. And so in parallel with the work at Yale, we have also generated iPS lines from deletion AS and various classes of non-deletion AS individuals. And we want to use these lines to address the specific role of non-UBE3A genes. So one of the things we're particularly interested in doing is comparing neurons derived from donors that have just a UBE3A mutation versus um, donors that have the larger AS deletion. And we believe that paralleling the difference in the behavioral phenotype, when we examine cellular and molecular phenotypes in these neurons, in these patient-derived neurons, 
that the cellular phenotypes in UBE3 mutation neurons will be less severe than what we see in the deletion neurons. And that would be a result of the contribution of the non-UBE3A genes. And then to identify involvement of specific genes, we're going to decrease the expression of selective genes in the UBE3A mutation neurons and see if that then contributes to the stronger phenotype that we see in the deletion neurons. So the one particular line that I want to talk about in these initial studies um, is an individual that had a UBE3A mutation. And um, this is also similar to what Allison talked about this morning. This mutation is caused by just one misspelling, one incorrect letter in the UBE3A gene uh, caused this um, phenotype. If you look in A, this is actually that, the, the, the family diagram. So this is an example where this is actually an inherited form of Angelman because the mother had this deletion, but she had it on her paternal allele. She inherited it from her father, so she was unaffected, but then passed it on actually to, in this case, two children who uh, developed Angelman as a result of this. So this particular mutation does not prevent UBE3A from being made, but it actually completely um, blocks UBE3A's ubiquitin ligase activity. So you have a UBE3A protein, but it's completely non-functional. And what we did with this line is we used genome editing using CRISPR technology to correct the mutation. Now just a, a, one second on why that's important. In our previous work looking at Angelman syndrome neurons, we've also done this with Do15Q neurons, we've looked at um, um, uh, individuals affected with Angelman and, and generated neurons and compared them to neurons from unaffected controls. And we can identify phenotypes that differ between those populations. The problem is there's so much genetic variability between different individuals is that you're always going to find some differences and not all of them can be attributed to Angelman syndrome. So it can be hard to know exactly what the important phenotypes are to focus on. So instead, what we really try to do now is develop what we call isogenic correction lines. So we take the line that's donated from the individual with Angelman syndrome, and then we correct it. In this case, we can simply correct this mutation and generate a line that's exactly genetically identical to the donor, except that the UBE, UBE3A function has been restored. So now when we compare neurons from these uh, these two IPSC lines, we're looking at everything's exactly the same genetically in these cells except for the, the loss of UBE3A due to the mutation. So now we take these lines and we want to see what are the cellular molecular phenotypes in these cells. One of the first things we look at is the ability of these cells to differentiate into different types of brain cells. So actually, rather than use the, the, the rapid differentiation, uh, we use a much longer differentiation. It can actually take months, but it mimics normal human development, and it results in a generation of multiple types of neurons and non-neurons that are found in the brain. So one of the first things we have to compare is, does the loss of UB3A change the ability to generate these different types of cells? And so I'm just going to quickly show you a few examples using this uh, technique called flow cytometry. In this first slide, we looked at a population of glutamatergic excitatory neurons. We use a specific marker for these neurons. There's a large population of these cells in our cultures. The relevant thing is that the proportion of these excitatory neurons is not different between the control, uh, the, uh, the corrected control neurons and the UBE3A mutation neurons. We also have a population of inhibitory neurons, which we know is also important in looking at the neuronal function. That's also not different. And we can generate glial cells endogenously in these cultures. So this is a marker for astrocytes, one type of glial cells. And again, there's no difference in the population between UBE3A mutation and corrected control. So we have the same cell types, the same cellular composition, and now we use electrophysiology to look at differences in neuronal activity and synaptic activity. So here we're comparing the corrected control neurons with the neurons that just have the UBE3A mutation. One of the phenotypes that we see uh, also in AS deletion neurons is a depolarized resting membrane potential. It means it's just an intrinsic property of these neurons uh, that um, is they're, they're a little more immature and they're a little hyper excitable. And we see a very similar phenotype in these uh, UBE3A mutation neurons that we've seen in the full AS deletion neurons. Another phenotype we see in these cells is that they have this intrinsic hyperexcitability. So if we inject different levels of current into the cell and monitor their action potentials firing that's shown on the left, 
we can see how fast they're able to fire. And the plot on the right is the maximum spike frequency. Again, we see this early in development and later in development that the Angelman neurons are hyper excitable. They fire more action potentials. They may be a little less hyper excitable, in fact, than the um, deletion neurons. We'll talk about that later. Um, there's a lot of phenotypes we looked at. I don't have time to show you all of them, but another important aspect is synaptic transmission, which again, Allison highlighted this morning. And she also highlighted in particular the importance of GABAergic inhibitory transmission, because if that's disrupted, it can cause motor problems, it can result in seizures, it does a lot of things to neuronal function. And so what we find here is that just the loss of UBE3A alone is enough to cause a decrease in GABAergic transmission. So those sweeps are the actual GABAergic synaptic currents recorded from individual neurons. And we can quantify uh, those currents and we see that there's a decrease in both the frequency and the amplitude of this GABA-mediated transmission in UBE3A neurons. So now we want to use an approach to try to figure out what other genes may contribute to a phenotype that would be more severe in the deletion neurons. And our approach to do this actually uses ASOs that you've heard about. We're going to use ASOs in these experimental protocols to decrease the expression of specific non-UBE3A genes with the prediction that if they contribute to the phenotypes in deletion AS, they should make the cellular phenotypes more severe in the deletion neurons. And so, um, again, highlighting the importance of these GABA-A receptor subunits that are in the deleted region, uh, we focused on GABA-A receptor subunits. We actually focused on uh, GABA-beta-3 subunit, which again, Allison mentioned, may be the one most likely to contribute to Angelman pathology. It's um, abundantly expressed during development. It plays an important role in neural development as well as inhibitory transmission throughout life. Um, Interestingly, GABA-beta-3 loss of function mutations also cause an interesting phenotype. And um, uh, Dr. Jang uh, reminded us uh, in his earlier talk that he was actually one of the first generators of a mouse that had this mutation uh, before he worked on the ue 3 a mutation mice. So this is a very interesting candidate uh, to look at. Um, just quickly, I want to just show you a little validation. So we have a, an ASO that's targeted to this beta-3 subunit. We can treat the cells just once with this ASO and get a very long-lasting decrease in the expression of the GABRB3 message, the mRNA, as well as the protein product, the GABA-beta-3 subunit. So that's a decrease that's maintained for a long time in development with a single treatment. And we also titrate the ASO treatment to produce about a 50% drop because we want to mimic the loss of one copy of this gene. We don't want to completely knock it out. In the deletion AS individuals, they're going to have a, approximately a 50% loss, so that's what we're mimicking here. And then we um, applied this drug to the um, UBE3A mutation neurons. So first on the left, I'm showing you that hyper, um, sorry, that depolarized resting membrane potential in the mutation neurons. If we add the ASO and knock down the beta-3 subunit, it's the same. It, it doesn't do anything there. In fact, we think that this phenotype is probably driven just by UB3A because it's very similar between this and the deletion neurons. The maximum spike frequency, that indicator of hyperexcitability, is also not affected by the beta-3 subunit knockdown. Um, we think this may actually involve other genes, but it may be other ones in the region, not beta-3. But interestingly, the decrease in inhibitory transmission that we saw with UBE3A loss alone is actually exac exacerbated when we knock down the beta-3 subunit. So now we see even a stronger decrease in the frequency and the amplitude of inhibitory transmission, and this could directly contribute to some of those phenotypes. So the depolarized resting membrane potential and the hyperexcitability were not affected. But the enhanced um, deficit in inhibitory transmission with knockdown suggests that targeting this beta-3 subunit, increasing expression, uh, could be an important target for Angelman syndrome. And it's important to know that the roles of these GABA subunits may just be underestimated in what we've looked at here. We only knocked it down for a short period during development, and we didn't knock down the expression of the other two subunits. So I think it's going to be important to really consider those as a cluster. They're always reduced together in, in deletion AS, and so we're now um, using approaches um, both with combined ASO treatments and with genome editing to decrease the expression of all three of those subunits. They may contribute strongly to the inhibitory synaptic transmission deficit, and also the loss of these subunits during early development may contribute to other intrinsic phenotypes in these neurons as well. So that's something we're, we're very actively involved in, um, in addressing. 
Um, one of the other um, phenotypes that we didn't, I didn't have a chance to mention to you um, uh, relates to what John Marshall was talking about. We also see in these UBE3 mutation neurons that there's a deficit in uh, BDNF signaling, similar to what he discovered in the AS mouse. And so we're actually collaborating with him now, looking at the ability of his drug to restore BDNF signaling in, um, in our human neurons and see how it impacts the different behavioral, sorry, the different cellular phenotypes that we see in these cells. So in my just last minute now, I want to introduce you to some other lines that we've also been generating that we think will be very useful for looking at the roles of the non-UBE3 genes. So in this case, we took um, an established uh, cell line, this H9 line, which is a wild type line that's very well characterized and differentiates into neurons very readily. And we used the CRISPR genome editing to create a series of isogenic, so same genetic background, um, IPS lines. So we generated a UBE3 deletion alone, just UBE3 deletion on the maternal allele. And we also generated a larger deletion that encompasses the region typically deleted in Angelman syndrome. And in fact, the strategy we use to create this deletion um, takes advantage of the same breakpoints that typically cause the deletion um, in, Angelman patient, in Angelman individuals. Um, so we think that this deletion is actually a very good mimic of what occurs in those individuals. Um, while we're generating that, we also ended up generating a paternal UBE3 deletion um, and a paternal large deletion. So the strategy for knocking out UB3A has been you know, reported by us and others previously. This large deletion is somewhat novel, so I just want to show you a little bit of an example of the gene expression that validates this cell line. So here we're looking at expression of different genes, and this is actually in neurons that have already been differentiated. Um, the first set of genes that are not circled are paternally expressed genes. They're genes that are normally silenced from the maternal allele. And so in these maternal deletion neurons, there's no change in those genes because they're, they're expressed just fine from the, maternal, from the paternal allele as they should be. But when we look at UB3A, we can see that imprinting has occurred in these neurons because there's now almost a complete loss of UB3A in these maternal deletion neurons. And to further validate this line, we can see that if we look at the biallelically expressed genes, the ones that are normally expressed from both copies, we get a, a, a decrease in expression consistent with the loss of one copy of these genes. So these cell lines are mimicking the gene expression we would expect from deletion AS. And so now by comparing maternal UBE3 deletion versus an isogenic line that has the larger deletion, any differences in the phenotype between those two lines must be due to the, 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 the decrease of the non-UBE3A genes. So it allows us to very um, specifically identify the cellular molecular phenotype that varies between these two populations, and then we can try to restore expression of specific genes in the deletion line, or knock down expression uh, using, for example, the ASOs in the UBE3A deletion line to identify which specific genes are involved um, in, that, in those phenotypes, and hopefully that will spur the development of, of other therapeutics. The other interesting thing about the, the mouse model is that obviously we've had this UBE3A deletion mouse, uh, several different versions of it for a long time. It's obviously difficult to generate a full deletion mouse. There are several groups working on it, and I think we'll see some progress on that soon. But one of the things we hope is that if we can identify specific genes that play important roles, that may inform the development of better mouse models because then rather than having to make the full deletion, you could target UBE3A plus one or two of these other genes. It might be a little easier to generate that model and then you'd have a valid mouse model that might better mimic deletion AS. Um, with creating these lines, we also created, a, I mentioned this paternal deletion, which is a good model of Prader-Willi syndrome, um, which we heard quite a bit about also in Dr. Baudet's talk. And interestingly, we also have a paternal UBE3A deletion, which of course is not going to cause Angelman syndrome because it's not going to disrupt UBE3A expression in neurons if it's deleted on the paternal side. But the interesting thing is that we know that not only is there a complete loss of UBE3A in neurons, but also in the brain, there's going to be a 50% loss of UBE3A in glial cells, in the non-neuronal cells. And um, in, in, um, in Albert's talk that we just heard, we, we heard about a potential important role of some of those glial cells because of their loss of one copy of UBE3A. So this line, the paternal deletion, will actually have a selective loss of UBE3A, one copy loss, in the glial cells, in the non-neuronal cells, while the neuronal cells will be, um, will be normal. 
And so any phenotypes that we detect in this line would directly implicate a role for UB3A in the non-neuronal cells. And that's also an important consideration for therapeutic development, because when we talk about unsilencing the paternal copy of UB3A, that only works in neurons that are silenced, uh, so cells that are silenced. So you're gonna restore UB3A in neurons, but the unsilencing approach is not gonna restore UB3A in the non-neuronal cells because they haven't been silenced to begin with. So that may be an important consideration also for therapeutic development. So I just want to acknowledge um, the people in my lab and our collaborators who participated in this work, uh, thank the NIH and the Angelman Syndrome Foundation for their funding, and I want to point out that all of the lines that I talked about today, all of the isogenic lines, as well as our other um, IPSCs derived from different classes of Angelman patients, as well as lines that we've developed for both prader willi and for DUP15Q syndrome, all of those cell lines are available for distribution from uh, the Yukon core to any researchers who are interested in using them. Thank you. Happens at the break, Albert and Yang Wei and Dr. Levine are all gonna get together and talk, and unfortunately, Nadav isn't here to talk about the CRISPR activation that he could do on your neurons that Albert Kwong at uh, North Carolina State can do in order to upregulate, figure out what genes, and you could all work together to solve the problem and then tell us what drug to develop. That's the plan, okay? Good. This is how we all work together. Yay.